If you had the ability to assimilate and imitate other organisms, and another form of intelligent life discovered and started experimenting on you, what would you do? In this How To Be video, we'll follow The Thing, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the humans in The Thing's prequel. If you think you have a better way, let me know in the comments. If you like these How To Be videos, consider liking and subscribing. Before we start following The Thing as the devil on its shoulder, we need to clarify what The Thing is, how it functions, and what it's abilities are. You know, grounded in fictional reality. Just in case you didn't realize this already, I'm not a biologist or a scientist of any kind. Even if I was, describing what the thing is is nearly an impossible task because it's so alien to our world. That, and it's an entirely made up creature for a movie, the director John Carpenter even mentions that they intentionally didn't try to explain how the thing imitates people because it would just bring up complex existential questions that would get in the way of a simple premise for a movie. So naturally, I take on the responsibility of trying to explain the unexplainable with no canonical references. Perfect. Should go swimmingly. Most people, especially the humans about to be strangled by the weaponized giblets of their former friend, think the thing is just a vile monstrosity of death flesh. With a bit of luck, wits, parkour skills, and access to an old World War II flamethrower, they can kill their thing friend and get an opportunity to put its blood under the microscope. At the microscopic level, we can discover that the thing is actually just a single-celled organism that imitates the cells of its host organism, hiding within it, replicating more and more, and ultimately taking it over completely. It may have originated from a virus, but the thing primarily operates at the cellular level and doesn't exhibit typical viral behavior. The lack of official documentation about the thing has spurred lots of speculation as to what type of cell it is. One thing's for sure, though. It's not some dumbass paramecia you studied in middle school. I don't think it's any one type of cell, actually, because it has the ability to transform into any cell it wants. I guess it shares a lot of similarities with the stem cell in that regard, but there's still something more fundamental going on within the thing's cell. It's DNA. I'm going to be treading into deep biological science stuff here, so I'm really relying on none of you actually understanding what I'm saying, or realizing it's 100% bull****. It. Great? Okay, let's continue. So there's something different about the thing's DNA. What does that even mean? First, a little refresher on DNA. DNA is basically a data storage medium within unicellular organisms that contains encoded instructions for life creation. This code tells cells how to survive, how to reproduce, and when and how to start specializing into specific cell types to form complex multicellular organisms with various organs or cell colonies working in unison. Your entire body in existence basically spawned from single cells following instructions encoded in their DNA. My point is that the same mind-blowing power of DNA that enables humans to be created is what gives the thing its superpowers. My speculation is that the thing's transformative and imitative abilities originate from its ability to fully edit its own DNA, as well as transcribe and translate, aka read, foreign cells DNA. This is unlike most species on Earth, which can only edit a percentage of their RNA. Editing the RNA is like editing the small messages a courier is already taking to the cell's factory. It's not as flexible as DNA editing. But even the ability to edit RNA is powerful. It might be what enables octopuses and other organisms to change their shape, color, regrow body parts, adapt to changing temperatures better, etc. However, RNA editing usually comes with the downside of reduced DNA plasticity, basically short-term adaptations at the cost of long-term evolution stunting. Editing the DNA, which the thing can do, is like editing the source code that produces the messages, meaning it can produce any messages it wants to, and the RNA will carry it to the cell's factory and create what it needs. You need tentacles? You got it. It's getting cold outside. Let's synthesize cold acclimation proteins and cold activated enzymes. You need to regrow a limb you lost? Cells will start dividing and specializing in that area again. I mean, this stuff is theoretically possible with artificial DNA editing humans are developing. Each thing cell basically comes packaged with CRISPR's DNA editing Cas9 enzyme and guide RNA installed, and its own DNA instructions and molecular machinery required to use it. Don't ask me how the f 
any of this is possible. From what I've gathered, the instructions or code that a unicellular thing executes is this. One, locate a foreign living cell and determine if it is suitable prey using chemical sensing. Two, morph a sharp pronged crown which can be used to pierce the prey cell's membrane. 3. Lyse the prey cell while extracting and encoding the prey cell's DNA template within its own DNA, which is what it can use to adapt to different situations and environments. 4. Imitate the prey cell by expressing genes encoded in the prey cell DNA template location of its own DNA. 5. We don't see how the thing's cells reproduce, but I'd imagine it undergoes cell division via mitosis. 6. Coordinate with other thing's cells using chemical sensing and specialize into other cells cell types as needed. Each new cell then would repeat the same six steps. As hard as it may be to believe, this is basically all the thing is at a cellular level. Six simple steps encoded into the DNA instructions of a cell. Instructions any single cell can process. Why do the thing cells follow these instructions? Why is their primary strategy imitation? I think it's actually a pretty genius strategy for a single-celled organism. For all of you who have played Command & Conquer, think of it like this. Why spend all of your resources building your own base to fight someone else when you could just send an engineer into their barracks, take it over, create more engineers, and take over the rest of their base without a shot fired? You generate their intelligence, assimilate their knowledge, commandeer their resources, all without a giant conflict. Killing is destructive. I'm also no historian, but from my quick scan of Genghis Khan, part of his success could be attributed to his assimilatory military strategies. Instead of destroying other armies, he would capture and incorporate them into his own military, which he could then use for further expansion. This strategy enables a small nuisance to become an extinction level threat very quickly. It's getting pretty obvious that the thing is gonna ravage Earth, but how would it fare against the champions of Teleria from this video's sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, which is a free-to-play turn-based strategy game on mobile and PC? Champions like Drexthar Blood Twin would probably end the thing outright. He's literally made of armor and fire. If I was the thing, I'd stack my numbers by assimilating all the champions that relied on hand-to-hand -hand combat. Humans like Outlaw Monk and Lizardmen like Saurus. Then, divide and assimilate the more dangerous magic-wielding enemies like Siffy the Lost Bride. Finally, we can eliminate immune foes like Amarantine Skeleton with our Thing army. It would be a difficult war, and who knows what the Thing could actually assimilate. That's what's so cool about this game. There's so many different types of champions and factions with unique biologies and abilities to contend with. This month, raids got their biggest ever update. The main event is the Doom Tower. It's a giant tower with 120 floors, a bunch of secret challenge rooms, and 12 daunting bosses to take on. They're also releasing 14 awesome new champions champions just in time for the holidays, along with a whole host of holiday events and tournaments. If you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description, and if you're a new player, you'll get your free Void Champion Bulwark, 50 gems, an XP booster, some energy refills, and even an Ancient Shard as soon as you get in-game. Rewards will be available only for the next 30 days and only for new players. Again, links in the description to download the game and get your rewards. Back to how the thing can quickly become an extinction level threat to humans. Even ignoring how powerful an assimilatory strategy is, the strengths of an imitation strategy are also apparent considering the asymmetric warfare the thing cells are engaging in. Thing cells imitating foreign cells will avoid detection and attack, both from the host organism's relatively massive, innate, and adaptive immune responses, as well as more sophisticated attacks that intelligent multicellular organisms create, like vaccines or surgery. Its stealth renders trillions of white blood cells impotent when faced with even one thing cell. Thing cells can lyse and replicate within the host organism almost completely uninhibited. This process most likely would not be painful, and the victim wouldn't even know it was happening. Your own human cells carry out similar processes of killing, dying, and reproducing on a daily basis. One million cells in your body die every second without you even noticing. Hell, you wouldn't even feel sick and your immune system wouldn't even notice. Maybe you'd know Notice that your fillings fell out of your teeth, but at most you'd only have a few seconds or minutes to be alarmed at this, because the assimilation process takes about 10 minutes. The average human body has about 30 trillion cells, 
If you got infected by even one thing cell, at around 10 seconds to lice replicate and divide, it would only take about 45 doublings for that thing cell to assimilate all 30 trillion pieces of you. Once the victim is completely lysed and replicated, things get interesting. No pun intended. See, the DNA within things cells don't just lice and replicate a host perfectly. Once the entire organism is assimilated, the DNA in the thing cells instructs them to specialize and start altering the biology of the host organism. This gives it the necessary intelligence, knowledge, and behavior to ensure further survival and infection of other organisms. At the end of the prequel movie, the dog thing somehow knows to avoid the gun-toting Lars, and knows how to find other research stations that are 100 miles away. This this suggests that the dog thing has more intelligence than just a dog. My theory is that the thing produces intelligence within any organism it inhabits by generating as advanced of a nervous system as it can. It wouldn't just create a massive brain though, because one, that would kind of ruin the whole imitation thing, and two, doing so would take away resources that the host body needs to function properly. This is also likely limited by the maximum intelligence that the thing's cells had ever assimilated prior. In a human host, the thing may only restructure the brain and alter the neurochemistry. In a dog, it may generate additional brain matter as well. In a colony of thing cells that were instructed to separate from the main thing organism, like one of those spider limbs, that cell colony will have to develop pretty much all of the systems an independent organism would need to survive, like a mouth, brain, legs, etc. How does DNA know to instruct cells to specialize in this fashion? I'd imagine like all cells. They coordinate with neighbor cells and gossip information around. Once the cells understand their resource limitations and current cell types, they can begin to restructure based on encoded instructions in the DNA to create forms relevant to these resource constraints. The dog thing knowing about other research stations, as well as Sanders thing knowing how to transform himself back into an alien pilot form capable of connecting to the neural bio ports of the spaceship necessary to operate it, and Blair thing knowing how to rebuild a spaceship, if you could call it that, all suggest that the thing is capable of storing, transferring, or generating generating massive amounts of knowledge. From what I can tell, there are a few ways to go about this. The things can all use forms of communication native to their hosts, like writing and talking to share information as a human thing. It's the lowest bandwidth, but the most discreet. Another option is to fuse together and use tendrils to directly transfer knowledge to one another, similar to how separate slime molds can conjoin to transfer learned behavior to each other. If it can meld its thing brain with a human brain, it could access all their information and control both the minds and bodies simultaneously, like how an octopus has nine Nine brains, with a central brain controlling eight other mini brains. The advantage is that the thing becomes smarter as it can directly process both brains' information. Higher bandwidth, but it's less discreet. I think the humans might be shocked when they figure out Susie and Brad are now physically conjoined. Both of these methods are sufficient for telling other things about your plan for world domination, but not highly complex blueprints for reorganizing your matter into other life forms or operating and engineering alien spaceships. The answer to this problem may lie in the most unassuming of all places, those same tiny strands of DNA. Remember when I said DNA was a data storage medium that contained all of the encoded instructions for how to create your body? Yeah, DNA can store a lot of data. Humans are currently exploring using DNA for data storage because it has a storage density of around 10 to the 19 bits per cubic centimeter. To give you perspective, at that density, all of the world's current data storage needs for a year could be well met by a cubic meter worth of DNA. Anything from simple hello world messages to Bitcoin private keys could be encoded. The thing can pretty much encode countless Noah's Ark's worth of instructions and life templates in its cell's DNA. DNA is also incredibly stable over time and has been demonstrated by the complete genome sequencing of a fossil horse that lived more than 500,000 years ago. Storing data within DNA also does not require require much energy, and it can be replicated error-free almost endlessly. I mean, the DNA in each human cell is around 3 billion digits long and has to be copied every time a cell divides, which occurs nearly 2 trillion times each day. It makes sense that with its ability to edit its own DNA, it would also use it for storing, transferring, and populating host brain matter with its accumulated knowledge. The thing would still need to retain most of the host's biology, though, compromising memories, personalities, behavior, 
behavior's emotional triggers, and anything else central to the host's identity could cause it to blow its cover. If the thing discarded a host human's memory of watching a football game with his friends last night and those friends brought it up the next morning, the thing would start to come under intense scrutiny. While avoiding detection is a priority, survival and assimilation is the priority. So whatever the thing assimilates will necessarily have altered biology to make the host aggressively and intelligently spread the disease. Similar to how Toxoplasma gondii can alter the physiology of its host, changing its mentality, behavior, and physical prowess to guide it towards other organisms, which it can then spread to. It might also help us to understand what the host thinks and feels, how its mindset changes, and how it becomes a thing. Like we talked about earlier, getting assimilated by thing cells is not a painful experience if you just happen to inhale them. Getting shivved by sharpened intestines is a completely different story, one that is painful as f what the victim may experience is the feeling of an epiphany with the restructuring of their brain and any knowledge piped in from other things, the shifting of their mood with the changing neurochemistry, urges forming from alterations to their endocrine system. The victim may feel more connected to the cells in their body, which can now edit their DNA to adapt to different situations and threats. They will still be able to understand human emotions and perspectives, but they won't feel human nor share empathy for humans. The core biology of who they are is fundamentally being lysed and developed in accordance with the survival instructions of the thing cells. Swallowing a drop of thing cells would be like swallowing the red pill in the matrix, which changes your entire viewpoint and alienates you from everything you once knew or held dear. A thing pill would turn an organism into a psychotic copy of themselves, an evil twin that disposed of the original. All this is necessary because if the thing cells perfectly imitated, say, Saul from Pineapple Apple Express, you just end up with a dumb, forgetful th yeah. insinuating like I'm forgetful thing that sat on the couch smoking and watching trippy YouTube videos all day. The thing cells would still infect and replicate other humans, Saul puffed and passed to, but it wouldn't be aggressively conspiring against the human race. This isn't optimal because the thing would no longer want to spread, but its cells would still be trying to assimilate other cells they came into contact with. Eventually, other humans would realize that Saul is basically causing the deletion and replication of other humans, and they would eliminate it. Him. You could argue that this Saul thing is the same person if no alterations occurred, but this gets into those existential questions John Carpenter talked about, like the ship of Theseus in the Chinese room. Knowing that all their cells were lysed, the DNA extracted and imitated, I would think that the thing's DNA is the master of the host organism now, that it is the organism. Personally, I wouldn't take any chances and I'd incinerate the Saul thing. Sorry Saul. While alterations are necessary, the thing cells would not want to alter the host biology too much. Overt abnormalities caused by severe biological alterations, like making the host body flood its arteries with Jack 3D's OG formula causing it to go apeshit on everyone, could blow its cover and other organisms would detect and destroy it. The thing is almost like a much more efficient, covert, and menacing version of the spores and pod people from Invasion of the Body Snatchers, with one key distinction, transformation. What makes the thing truly terrifying is its ability to weaponize giblets and reorganize its biomass to adapt to different situations. Most of the early assimilation process, coming from a single cell to assimilating the entire organism, is based on DNA instructions, but transformations seem to be influenced consciously. Now I don't think the thing is consciously telling each cell what to do, that would be ridiculous. Instead, I think it's more of the thing's nervous system sending generalized commands or environmental changes which the cells reorganize around. Same as a human brain processes sensory stimuli and converts that stimuli into electrical signals which travel all throughout the body, causing chemicals called neurotransmitters to be released, which perform some type of magic which results in your body's cells reacting and fulfilling your request. It's all very scientific stuff. 
This does have a semblance of basis in our reality. When studying octopuses and squid, Joshua Rosenthal, a neurobiologist, mentioned that these cephalopods may edit their RNA based on things as simple as temperature changes, but also based on things as complicated as experiences or memories, indicating some form of conscious control over their adaptations. So the thing isn't an insane, impossible organism after all. Okay, it, it is, but it's not like the f Hulk or Superman, both of which are operating on straight up bullshit. When the thing is in charge of an intelligent host organism, it will only consciously cause bodily mutations as a last resort if it's under attack. In some cases, this may be a reflexive or subconscious reaction if the thing is severely wounded, loses its consciousness and thus control over its cell colonies, or if the host's biology emits too much of a fight or flight response from the mimicked amygdala of a human. Springing tentacles out of your ass is gonna freak people out, which is not good for you, especially if they have flamethrowers. Completely restructuring your 30 trillion cells also costs a ton of energy. First law of thermodynamics still applies here, so if you're gonna be transforming, you better have a pile of steak nearby. While the thing can definitely absorb some serious damage and survive extremely inhospitable conditions, I think we have to remember that the thing is still a carbon-based organism, and will still die if it doesn't have energy or functioning bodily systems. It needs to consume food or other biomatter which it would break down for energy, especially if it's doing a lot of transforming. It needs oxygen, circulating blood, etc. Which means it can't just disregard vital organs, and it has to maintain and repair them if damaged. Bullets may not kill it easily, but it could seriously impair the thing by causing it to have to spend time and resources repairing itself before it can be operational again. Man, John Carpenter saying to avoid getting into the biology and philosophy of the thing because it would just get in the way of a simple premise was quite prescient. What's that saying? Never let the truth get in the way of a good story? Now that I think about it, my channel is literally all about breaking making these fundamental storytelling rules. Anyways, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what the thing is. At least now we have a general framework on which to base our decisions and actions on. On to the movie. We start out following the thing after it had been abducted by an alien zoological expedition and placed in storage on the alien spaceship for research purposes. You might be thinking, why in tarnation would they bring the freaking thing on board? Well, the thing may have been imitating a cute little tree bear type animal at the time of abduction, leading the aliens to completely underestimate it. It still doesn't excuse the fact that the aliens are pretty much as dumb as the expeditionaries in Alien Covenant for just tossing alien organisms onto their ship carelessly. The thing then broke out of its containment and attacked the aliens, realizing the nature of the thing and the immense danger it posed to not only their homeworld but also to the rest of the galaxy, they decided to crash their spaceship into Earth in northern Antarctica around 100,000 years ago. What I don't fully understand is why the aliens didn't warp their spaceship into the sun if they knew they were doomed. Yes, the sun is really far away, like 100 million miles far, but an interstellar alien species would have to be using an anti-gravity propulsion system, like an Alcubierre drive, which enables faster than light travel, which means warping into the sun shouldn't take any time at all. Warping into the sun isn't even the least they could do. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt, though. Maybe a fight broke out and the warp drive was disabled or sabotaged, but it's still a bitch move because even 100,000 years ago, Earth was teeming with life, human and not. It's literally the only place planet in the solar system that has intelligent life. At minimum, they could have driven their spaceship into the Earth's moon, or pulled a Master Chief and overloaded the ship's reactors, causing a catastrophic explosion. Seriously, he did that like five times in the games. There is some speculation that the thing was a bioweapon created by the aliens, but had that been the case, better containment facilities and procedures likely would have been implemented. After the crash, the thing left the damaged ship and ultimately succumbed to the freezing conditions where it would then be in tombed in ice for a hundred thousand years. The question is, why would it leave the ship if it knew it was certain death? Or was it even the thing at the time when it left the ship? We know that it wasn't the alien pilot fleeing from the thing because the bug-like corpse the Norwegians found was not the same as the alien form found piloting the ship but it could have been another non-thing creature that was abducted and stored by the aliens which broke free and tried to escape the thing by running into the freezing Antarctic conditions with nowhere else to go. Hard to argue with that decision because, I mean, I'd rather freeze to death and end up like Adam Finch. 
I don't think this was the case though. If the thing was ignorant of its location on the planet, it may have thought that these winter conditions were seasonal, that there may be nearby life it could hunt, in which case it would attempt a journey many miles from the ship. The fact that the thing was found nearby the ship indicates that it knew it was hopeless and intentionally froze itself. So whenever, if ever, someone detected the ship's distress signal, they would find it and awaken it. It makes sense that the thing would know it was hopeless, because it would have assimilated or brain piped the alien pilots, uncovering their knowledge of this planet, the life that resides on it, and the reason the aliens chose to crash here was because it was remote and inhospitable, with most of the intelligent life inhabiting Africa on the other side of the planet, in a busted ship with no supplies to fix it, there were no other options than to get some icy cold sleep and just wait. For the thing, running out into the freezing conditions wouldn't necessarily be certain death. Maybe it was a survival strategy. As it lays down in the snow, the thing's highly adaptable cells would start producing antifreeze to avoid lethal intracellular ice crystallization, as well as other adaptations present in psychrophilic templates it had stored in its DNA. The freezing conditions would cause cells to elicit the gene expressions for these adaptations, much like the cephalopods mentioned earlier, undergoing a form of natural cryonic preservation. In this state, the thing would enter a deep sleep until it would be awakened by the thawing of the ice or it was found. It could be eons, it could be forever. Slept is also a misnomer. This process of freezing reduces metabolic activity immensely, almost bringing it to a halt completely. No aging would occur, no energy expended, no perception of time passing. The reduced metabolic activity coupled with the stability of the DNA means that once the thing is thawed, it's game on immediately. In the ice it would be held in stasis, waiting until those humans reproduce, evolve, gain intelligence, turn Turn the dirt, trees, and water into complex material, circuits, and energy. Wait until they spread across the planet and dare to explore the same inhospitable location where the thing lies, where they would eventually find it and their curiosity would drive them to awaken it in all its horrors. The next thing the thing would know is its awakening consciousness. Warmth flows in through a hole in its ice coffin, where its alien skin is sending pain impulses from. It's still frozen in place, though the ice is weakening and melting. It sells metabolic activity is firing up, breathing life back into it. It might be wondering why it's awakening now and into what world. It hears a faint noise, something rhythmic. <laughs> and then hears a loud noise and some muffled chattering. Boom! Jesus <laughs> Voices. These weren't the noises of aliens who had come to recover their spacecraft. It may be the voices of those bipedal organisms from Africa. The thing must have been waiting for this moment, but now that it's finally arrived, it's struck by fear. It will know that for the bipeds to find it, they must be sufficiently advanced and intelligent. Adversary is not to be taken lightly. As the thing is awakened, it will probably feel a pain in its side, recognizing that a precise hole was made into its body, though it's encased in ice. This would confirm that these bipeds are intelligent as this hole was likely made with sophisticated tools with a purpose of obtaining a sample that they would use for experimentation. All the thing's cells would have already completely assimilated and imitated the host organism, so they won't readily discover its assimilation abilities yet. A discovery of an alien organism in spaceship will be communicated to the rest of their species though. It's only a matter of time before the nature of the thing is found out and destroyed due to its danger danger it poses. The thing must know this. It needs to get out of the ice ASAP so it can collect intel and find out exactly what it's dealing with in order to come up with a strategy. With the ice finally weakening enough, it can use its alien form's strength to break out and escape. It looks like a small town, a population of 15 to 20 bipeds or so. Buildings are constructed from lumber and steel, and there's relatively sophisticated vehicles, machinery, and tools. In order to populate this frigid region and construct all of this, they would need to have brought all this material in from other regions of the planet, meaning this world is potentially full of intelligent life to assimilate. So far, every organism that discovered the nature of the thing has refused communion. 
feared it and tried to destroy it. This species is unlikely to be any different. If the thing is to survive and spread its good word of salvation and communion, it needs more information about these bipeds, like what they know and how they think. It can't exactly walk up to them and say hi though, partially due to the language barrier, but also partially because it's an alien that they want to capture and kill. It needs to find an isolated biped which it can assimilate unnoticed and use to hide amongst the other bipeds. It's the cellular battlefield projected onto a bigger stage, similar to how one thing cell needs to hide amongst the host cells. One thing human needs to hide amongst the entire human species. Luckily, the thing finds a biped in one of the machines, searching for something, as well as a quadruped. Both are isolated from the rest of the group. What assimilation strategy should it use though? With search parties out looking for the thing, being quick and discreet is necessary. There's no time for shoving tentacles into the biped's head to brain pipe information out. It should assimilate the biped in the machine first. There is more knowledge and power to be gained. While one cell may take 10 minutes to fully assimilate it, shoving a fistful into it will take seconds. It should just pin this biped down and infect it, turning it into a separate autonomous thing organism, converting an enemy into an ally. The information contained within the thing's DNA will propagate throughout their body. The templates of all prior assimilated life will be accessible to them. The cellular alterations weaponizing their identity, memories, personality, knowledge, their very humanity against their own kind. The Griggs thing, now a part of the thing's species, will know how many people are in camp, what each of them are like, what weapons and transportation they have, nearby research stations, and the status of the entire human race. The dog is nearby too, barking loudly. The Griggs thing would know the location of the nearby American research station, who was there and how far it is. He would know that these Norwegian researchers had not radioed out about the alien yet because their leader is arrogant and foolish. Greg's thing would also know that humans love dogs and can't resist petting them. There's a deep bond between human and animal that can be exploited, not to mention the dog barking will alert the humans to its location. Greg's thing should then go on to infect the dog. <laughs> The dog infected with the thing DNA would develop more complex brain structures capable of understanding the Griggs thing. Human-dog interactions are much shallower than human-to-human, -human, and thus there is not a need to retain much of its former biology, save for the four legs and fur. The latter make this form a capable runner in the snow. The dog thing could help infect others at this station, but Griggs thing is more than capable of handling that. Griggs thing should natively communicate to the dog thing and tell it about the nearby research stations that it should run to. Thule is a fictional research station, but in the movies the Norwegians reference Haley Station, which is northwest where their helicopters refueling at, McMurdo, which is in the south where they want to take the injured Olav, and an unnamed Russian station 50 miles from them, probably Novolazarevskaya. Based on these, I'd say Thule Station is the most representative of the real Norwegian troll station. Haley is too far to run straight to, but there are numerous research stations surrounding them to the right and left that are close enough. It's currently winter in Antarctica, which means most ships and flights out are cancelled until the summer due to the darkness and extreme cold. The only way out of Antarctica during this time of year would be to schedule an emergency C-17 transport, which would take them back to Christchurch, New Zealand, or wait for the one winter fly-in for the season. This might draw too much attention though. It would probably be better to wait for the austral summer when people are rotated out and taken back home. It's still wise to have the dog think infect other stations in the meantime, just in case the Norwegians are craftier than they look. Alternatively, Greg's thing would have knowledge of birds and vast sea life, but with no blueprints stored in the DNA, there is not really a way to transform into them as a means of escape. If the things do get discovered and word gets out to the rest of the world resulting in their Antarctica-wide quarantine, hopefully it could flee to the coast and assimilate some form of sea life. I'm not sure what the fishing is like off the coast of Antarctica, but if it could grab a fishing rod, catch a fish infected and throw it back in the water, well, there is plenty of biomatter to assimilate and use against the humans. I'm just imagining three trillion fish sprouting legs and storming the beaches worldwide, which sounds less scary and more like a sh 
the sci-fi original. Best not to get too far ahead of themselves, though. They need to first defeat these Norwegians that are trying to capture them. You're probably thinking, wait, this is the end of the video and we haven't beat the humans yet. What's going on? Well, I'm gonna try to separate this into two parts this time so I can get the first part out faster. This part had a lot of setup, but part two is gonna continue straight to the action and where we will figure out if we can really beat the humans or not. I will see you guys then.